Joining me now, Joe Lonsdale of 8VC, co-founder of Palantir, and also a board member for the Reagan Institute, and that's where we are, the Reagan National Economic Forum. It's a beautiful place. Thanks for having me, Morgan. We're, we're here to celebrate freedom and courage and fighting communism and American business. Yeah, so how are you doing that right now with, uh, with investment flows? You know, well, there's a lot of stuff we're focusing on in my work. Uh, I think the defense world is heating up a lot in the last five or six years, thanks to the kind of tracks laid by Palantir and SpaceX. And then Andrel, you have a lot of new defense companies and the leadership of the DOD is adopting great things there. And then, you know, AI is, I think it's actually going to finally hit productivity statistics in the next couple of years, which we desperately need. If you're listening on the stage here, everyone's talking about our national debt, all these challenges we face economically. If we can get productivity up, that solves problems for everyone. Mm. Um, you're taking a new AI startup out of stealth. Oh, that's mistaken. right. That's right. Let's talk about it. <laughs> that's right. Well, you surprised me with this. Well, you know, th so Thorin, listen, Thorin's working on a problem that, that I'm passionate about. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're building new companies, the question is what's possible now that wasn't possible a few years ago? And, you know, one of the issues a lot of leaders have, uh, myself, a lot of my friends here, is that you basically end up having to be a traffic cop for all this inbound, all this stuff coming in. I remember uh, on the board here with me is Speaker Paul Ryan. When he was Speaker of the House, I remember he was just so frustrated because you just got thousands of things hitting you and you just have to direct it everywhere. So the question is, how can you work with your team and AI to handle all of this in, in a better way and get reports on it and make it accountable? As we've come up with some really, really neat things that are already saving me hours per week and we're going to try to let everyone else use it as well. Mm. There's a big debate sort of brewing, and I realize it might be, you know, we might not know yet, but sort of this idea of, okay, you increase productivity, but at what risk to the workforce? How are you thinking about it? This is, uh, listen, this is a really tough conversation. Fortunately, I'm not a politician, so I can just be really blunt with you. Like, I well, would expect nothing less, yes. Joe. So I'm going to say this, and it's going to be taken out of context, but you actually need to destroy some jobs for the country to do better. And so what I mean by this is, Morgan, if we wanted to all have infinite jobs, we would ban farm tools. We're looking out over a beautiful valley with lots of farms, and in the old days, to get that much food, you would have had 10 times as many people making that food. And that would be lots of jobs. That would be a terrible thing, right? We'd all be much poorer. Everything would be more expensive. So what you actually need to do with AI is you need to raise productivity, which means fewer people could do more with less, and, and the whole society then gets wealthier. And then there's other things that other people can create. And, and so, so if productivity finally does go up, that's a good thing. It's not something to be afraid of. It's something we desperately need. Hmm. And of course, that becomes an engine for economic growth as well. That's the only way you grow. That's the only way that we get wealthier in this economy is doing more with less. And, and everyone's afraid of it, but it's actually ironic that you have this Luddite fear because this is the only way we solve our national debt crisis. It's the only way that the working class and middle class can more easily afford health care, can afford the cost of living, can afford nice homes. Like a lot of the young people now, especially in our cities and around there, they can't afford a cost of living at all. They can't afford to have kids. It's a mess. Uh, AI and higher productivity could actually solve all of these things. Mm, and I do want to get into healthcare because I know you're looking to tackle that too. Um, but first, just going back to national debt, uh, you and I have had conversations about Doge and some of the cost cut cutting efforts in Washington. Today is Elon Musk's last day working with the administration in that capacity. Is Doge at risk? You know, listen, I think they've cut, what, about $150, $160 billion, and everyone likes to scoff at it and make fun of it. That's $150 billion per year. So you, what is that worth from an equity perspective? Well, based on the cost of capital for the government, that's $3 trillion. So any, anyone else who hasn't already created a $3 trillion company in 150 days, it's not something to scoff at, right? This is something that's very impressive. Now, he's not allowed to stay longer, but I have a lot of really smart friends who are in the government who are working on Doge, who are pushing us further. Uh, I, I hope they take the 150 and they double it. And, and if they do, that's another few trillion dollars of value for our country. This is amazing. And, and not only is it value for our country, a lot of it's turning off a lot of stuff that was really corrupt. So, so I think they've done a great job overall. I think they're going to keep fighting. I hope they keep fighting hard on it. Mm. What do you think about the big, beautiful bill? And I know there's been some, you know, chatter or, or back and forth about what can be baked into reconciliation, what can, especially when you are talking about cost, cost cuts. But what do you think about that? Listen, I think overall, overall, I like it. I think these things are compromises. You, you can only afford to lose like we were saying, two representatives or three representatives in the House and two or three in the Senate, so it's really hard to get it done. I personally care a lot more about cost-cutting, about what are called rescissions, so I hope we add a bunch of rescissions to it. I think there's a lot more things you can cut in the government that we need to do that. But, I mean, overall, there's a lot of things they've put in there. We're here at the Reagan Library. He believed in lower taxes and deregulation, and I think that this bill is kind of in that spirit in terms of what they're doing. So we talked about defense. We talked about AI. Let's talk about health care because we know right. it's pretty broken. I love it. 
So how do you start to tackle that issue and what are you excited about in terms of the innovation and technology that can do it? This is, this is a really important area for our society. There's two sides of healthcare. There's healthcare services, which is the cost of our insurance and our, and our providers, and there's, and there's the bio side. I think we'll start with the bio side. We're in a crisis in biotech right now. China has gone from zero to 30% of the market in just about five or six years. They're growing really, really fast, and it's not all honest. There are smart people in China doing smart things, but they're also stealing a lot. So what they do is we spend a lot of money on research, we find the new target here, and because our FDA is so slow, because it takes us 10 years to get our company through, they could take a company we started a year or two ago, go after the same target, get through their regulators faster, and then sell it back to our pharma companies. And that's what they're doing. And, and what this means is it's really hard for us to invest in certain things if we know they're just going to be able to run the circles around us and effectively steal it away. And so we desperately need our FDA to create new pathways and to go much, much faster. It's the only way to keep bio working in this country. So that's something we're working really hard on. It's really important because there's a lot of new possibilities that are saving lives in bio, but we have to be allowed to invest in it. And then the other side of it is the healthcare services side. That's also huge. This is obviously, you know, almost 20% of our economy and every one of our cities has these systems that are effectively cartels and they've passed laws in every state blocking competition, blocking your ability to build new providers, blocking your ability to, pa to patients shop to get patients to get their data. So this administration is working really hard to get patients the right to be able to take all of their data out of that health system, bring it into any app someone builds, and then use that to shop and bring down costs. So I'm really excited for it. Mm, and of course, this is an area that has been very sticky when you look at inflation data. Is it's the cost disease. It's the biggest problem in our country in terms of cost disease. If you know, we're talking about debt, our real debt is $150 trillion of health care debt with Medicare and Medicaid that we've promised but we haven't funded. If that keeps going up 6-7% a year, no one's going to get health care except for maybe the rich, which is, you know, my, my kids and grandkids might be fine. It's going to be really bad for everyone else. It's not okay with me. And AI, by the way, is going to make this a lot cheaper, but it has to be allowed to compete. You have to be allowed to build new things with AI to make health care better and cheaper, and that's going to be a big fight we're going to see. What are your thoughts on tariffs, especially, and we haven't seen them yet, but this idea that maybe you see tariffs put in place regarding the pharmaceutical supply chain? You know, it's, it, it's interesting. I'm going to have a talk with Mark Andreessen at, at lunch here, of course, on this, and he has very strong opinions about the McKinley-era tariffs, which is, which is something, right, that Trump's echoing right now. There probably are some purposes for tariffs strategically for national security, including in pharmaceuticals. And I'm biased. I've built, I've helped put billions of dollars into advanced, you know, manufacturing for bio here. And if China and India are going to steal all of that away, we're going to have none of it during a crisis. That's really dangerous. If they're going to steal away all of our advanced manufacturing for the things we need to build drones, to build ships, to build these things we're building here, that's not good. So at the very least, we do need tariffs for all of these strategic sectors. And, and then beyond that, uh, you know, this is a controversial topic. I, I understand the economic theory of where they're coming from. It's not my favorite thing to do, but I, I don't think they're necessarily wrong. Uh, you raised a fund earlier this month. You closed a fund. Uh, looking across the investment landscape, what are you excited about? And what do you think of valuations? So HVC Fund 6 is focused on... Uh, you know, really a lot of the new stuff in AI. I think that's the biggest thing by far. You know, a lot of the core AI companies working on AI itself have insanely high valuations. There's a talent war right now where these really top young minds will be go for a million, two million dollars. And I heard of someone getting paid $40 million a year the other day because they were a top person being fought over by the top companies. It's crazy, right? Valuations are really high. Now that said, if you're applying AI in the services economy or otherwise, I'm very bullish on that. So we have a $5 trillion a year service economy by wages. In over 40% of that economy, we've already seen how you could double the productivity. So there's just a long tail of great things to do with AI. I'm very bullish on that. All right, Joe Lonsdale, it's great to speak with you, as Thanks always. Good to see you.